Hi, I'm Ella Feingold. I'm an orchestrator. I hope you're doing really, really well. Um, today I wanted to break down um, a couple of pages of a cue that I orchestrated for a film called Boxing Day. It's a um, Christmas rom-com that just came out. The composer was kind enough to allow me to share my orchestration um, for the purpose of demonstrating stuff and so that's exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, the reason I wanted to do this is because some of these things tie into piano transcription techniques that I've talked about in previous videos. I also wanted to show what it's like to orchestrate MIDI and sort of what it means to be an orchestrator today rather than 1911 in Ravel's day, which God, I wish I was born in that era. Um, and I wish I could orchestrate like Ravel, but here we are. Um, but I think I have some things to share and ideas of my own that I want to share with you. So we're going to go bar by bar. Um, there was a book by Cecil Forsyth called Choral Orchestration, where he led you bar by bar how to orchestrate um, the decisions that go into everything, even down to laying out the pages, you know, four bars at a time and whatnot. Um, I think there's a big void in teaching orchestration about um, how do we orchestrate. Um, you know, there's books on instrumentation and ranges and all these things, but once we learn the range of a flute, um, where it projects, where it's weak, etc., then what? You know, how do we get started orchestrating? Do we orchestrate the strings first, the brass first, the woodwinds? Do we orchestrate the melody first and then the accompaniment? And um, I know that there's a lot of different ways to do this, but I think what's helpful is when people can see how people work and the decisions that they make. And uh, I know for me, when I was beginning orchestration, that was something I was most curious about. And Ravel even talked about this himself. Someone was maybe asking him about how he composed or orchestrated. I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something to the effect of like the, that his genius is, is how he works and not what he writes. Um, so I'm not a genius and I'm not Ravel, but I'd like to share with you how I do some of these things. So on the left here, this is a MIDI file. This is typically what an orchestrator today receives from a composer. This MIDI has already been prepared for me by someone on my team, which means that they've quantized durations. Maybe they've decided on enharmonics favoring flats or sharps. Um, that's not necessarily always the case, but sometimes that's a nicety. And as an orchestrator, it's your job to go, no, nah, this is better in sharps, actually, or whatever. Um, there is a video that Tim Davies made that really breaks down the process from getting MIDI and, you know, quantizing it in Digital Performer. So I would suggest anyone who hasn't seen that video to check out Tim Davies' blog and his page um, where he'll, you know, take you step by step. So, um, <clears throat> so here we go. Um, this is what was delivered to me. And I have a lot of decisions to make here. So, um, first of all, I receive MIDI. I look at everything. I try and understand um, just the, the arc of the music. Where are the climaxes? How do we get to the climaxes? How do we get out of them? What is this piece of music saying? Um, I need to know all of those things because we don't just assign colors just because we saw it in a score um, or we think it's gonna sound good. I mean, there, there needs to be a reason behind why we're doing certain things. Otherwise, we're just sort of putting brush strokes on the canvas for no reason. Um, Conrad Pope, who happens to be my absolute favorite orchestrator, has a Facebook group called Conrad Pope Orchestration and someone a long time ago asked him a question about how much is too much and in that question he really put a lot into his answer and talked about um, 
how he looks at a piece of music before he begins orchestrating. And I think that's the best answer um, to how to look at a piece of music before you get started and know what needs to happen. So I would also point anyone who doesn't already subscribe to Conrad Pope's Facebook group to go check that out because he is a treasure trove of information. He's been somewhat of a mentor to me over the years and I continue to learn from him. So um, you should check out his group. So this cue is called Josh Declares Love. It's pianissimo, it's airy, it's light, it's tender. And so I need to choose colors that evoke that if what was delivered um, doesn't already evoke that, which of course it does, because this composer is wonderful and knows how to do his job. So um, I'm just going to refine things. So right here I'm being very literal for the most part. So this was delivered in the flute. It's perfectly playable in the flute. There's no problems whatsoever. But because this is Josh declaring love to a woman, I want this to be a little bit more tender, I guess. And I don't want this to project as much. So I chose to put this in the piccolo because I know as an orchestrator that this is going to give me a flute-like color because it's a flute. Um, but it's just going to be a little bit... It's not going to project as much, a little bit more transparent. Um, so that's the first decision that I made. I put a slur over um, this gesture. So I phrased it. I put soloist in the page to let them know that they are playing a solo part to give them context with the music. Okay, the next thing that I did was I transferred the harp part into my score and I was quite literal with this. The only thing that I did was to put in harp pedaling, which is our job, um, and uh, I phrased it I put in dynamics, I ask them to play romantically. I'm someone that likes to put in these descriptors in the music. Um, if you've score studied, um, score read John Williams music, you'll know it's everywhere. And um, I think it's important, especially when they're sight reading and they've never seen this music, to give them a sense of um, what the emotion is in the music. and. I would say, you know, it can't hurt and it might help. So with the harp and choosing the color of the piccolo, this was somewhat, somewhat literal here. The last thing that was delivered to me was a pedal note, uh, this G here in low strings long, which could be anything, you know, this could be a violin, this could be a viola, this could be a cello. And it's up to me to decide what's the appropriate color. A lot of orchestrators might just copy that into a cello and say, I'm done, <laughs> let's go to the next page. And you know, there's times that that's absolutely the right call. You don't need to overthink it, <laughs> excuse me. But I like to overthink things or I just like to think about all the different angles. So. The music's pianissimo, it's airy. This person's declaring um, love. And there's something a little bit, probably if you've ever professed your love to someone, there's something tender and you don't know how the person's going to receive it. Maybe you're a little bit nervous, a little unstable in the sense of, you just don't know what the expect what the outcome's gonna be. And I wanted to evoke that in the orchestra. And, you know, if they bowed this arco on the cello and I put a mute on it at pianissimo, it's fine. But I thought that harmonics would be a little bit sort of unstable, a little airier, a little weaker, and just as an orchestrator would blend better as a sort of pedal, sonorous fluid. You'll notice just that the composer wrote a pedal. And in this case, it's kind of like anticipation, you know, something's holding on, we're not moving. I mean, there is movement up top, but this pedal is sort of grabbing our ankle and saying, wait a minute, we're not going anywhere. Let's stay right here. So as an orchestrator, if I zoom in here, 
I know that um, this G note that was written is available to me as a natural harmonic on the cello. I also know that this harmonic is available to me in the basses as a natural harmonic on their G string at the halfway note. I have six celli playing this with the mutes on. All, all of the strings are in the mutes, in mutes. And um, from my experience and trial and error, I know that I don't need all four basses on this harmonic. I know that I just want a little bit of that color to um, go with the celli and not overwhelm the sound of the cello harmonic. So one bass, two basses, it's enough. Um, okay, so this was a lot of decisions that went into quite literally what was given to me. And you can see that we sort of refined things a little bit and some things were just quite literal and we were almost like an editor and just put in some phrasing and dynamics. So to zoom in a little bit further, um, and I guess maybe this is sort of going into imagination and a little bit of um, piano transcription techniques. Um, when we're orchestrating piano music, you know, of course we're, we're giving the music a new lease on life and um, we're not necessarily being literal, but one of the things is when we when we look at the music, if we were to pretend that this was piano, is sometimes we're we're making a meal out of it. We're looking for all of the things that, that we can possibly do, that we can see beyond just the notes. And if I zoom in, I see a line here. Um, so to me, this is almost like um, I wouldn't call this a duet, but making a, a another character known. Um, I will always give the disclaimer, this is playback, this is not reality, but to give you a sense of what this sounds like, this is what the piccolo is doing. Okay, so I saw this and, and heard in my inner ear this sort of counterline, like the piccolo, meaning Josh, is speaking to someone. Um, and so I wanted that someone to be present. I didn't want it to be very present, so I chose a color very deliberately, which was the clarinet. And it's marked pianissimo, and it's subtone, so it's really going to be transparent here. Now, I cued this. So what is a cue in film and video game music? A cue in this particular case means play only upon request. So it's as if this music is playing, but there's a mute button on it. The reason I did this was, no, I didn't technically write this counter line, and you should never be writing stuff when you're orchestrating for someone, but this was technically something that was in the music that I sort of brought out. I chose to cue it because the composer didn't write this and I don't want to get fired. I think this is going to sound great, so it's there if the composer decides that they'd like to hear the cue and hear what it sounds like in the music. Okay, so this was me sort of using a piano transcription technique and bringing something out that was, you know, sort of buried in the writing. Um, now, I did two other things that were not in MIDI that I thought would refine things and, and, and bring things out a little bit more um, in the texture. Um, before I talk about that, I guess I should probably play the piccolo and the clarinet together and hear what that sounds like. So there's that. All right, so let's zoom in here. Um, what are we doing in the second violin and in the viola? So because this is outside and it's airy and I'm trying to evoke nature, I instruct them to do toneless bow noise, bow directly on bridge, quasi breath noise. Um, the mute was an oversight because they obviously need to have the mute off to do this. So 
that was me not proofreading well enough, and I will admit to my mistakes. Um, so this is just a great color. I use this sometimes. This particular cue, it's great. There's times where maybe it sounds like mic noise and it's not the right call. Um, but this was great here um, and the composer loved it. So the last thing that I did on this page is I called for two solo violins, consort, to be playing harmonics. And these harmonics sound the same pitches, this DB here, um, with the piccolo. So, I also cued these things because, again, I didn't want to get fired. I thought this would be something that uh, put a little bit of a, a mist around the piccolo. This is, I guess, what Ravel would call orchestrating rather than instrumenting. Meaning, you know, fine, it sounds lovely in the piccolo, but what can we do to give the effect of the sustain pedal or build a mist around the sound? I wasn't conscious when I was doing it, but I guess looking at this now that this is sort of what he might consider orchestration. Um, just putting something maybe behind it that you don't necessarily suspect. And why did I do this? Why did I choose this color? Well, let's give credit where credit is due. Um, I am someone who loves to score read every day and for a lot of different reasons. And I was score reading um, some Charles Keclin. And I saw that he used a lot of harmonics, natural and artificial, but he used them in a different way. He was using them as short gestures, and he was using them with the upper woodwinds, with flutes and piccolo. And as orchestrators, we know that harmonics, at times, depending on range, are in the sonority of a woodwind, and they go very, very nicely together. So he never did this, but it gave me the idea of using it with shorter gestures. And this was just something in my imagination um, and a little bit of intuition, knowing that that blends with upper woodwinds. So I instructed them to do up bows because I'm orchestrating the dynamic because it's quieter as an up bow than a down bow. And I also wanted a little bit of a pulse. Um, so that's why I did those markings. And if you look here in the piccolo, they're doing a trill. So there's motion. And I wanted to have an equivalent motion here. So I'm not going to give them trills because they're playing harmonics. So they'd have to do this um, and, and keep a perfect fourth shape. So I gave them just some unmeasured tremolo. So You'll see on this page, there was a lot of decisions. Some of these things were literal. Some of these things were bringing something out that already existed. Some things were refinement. Some things were imagination. So I'm just trying to show all of the decisions that go into this. Um, it's just such an amazing craft orchestration, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's my favorite thing in the world. Um, so to wrap up, just on the last page here, um, you'll see that this is where the music ends here. And um, I've talked about before that when the music changes, you know, the orchestration should change. And the music didn't change here. So I don't need to introduce some contrast. Um, but I just would like to do something that just makes these four bars feel a little bit different. And so I chose to do something very, very subtle and almost imperceptible. And all I did was I asked them to continue to do bow noise on the bridge, this breathy sound, but to just do these episodic, subtle tremolos to just maybe evoke, I don't know, because they're outside, the leaves and... and um, just nature, you know? And it was maybe a one for contrast rather than a 10. And it was great. Um, and that's all I needed to do. I mean, what else could I have done? Could I have put this clarinet into say, I don't know, uh, a bassoon in this register? Sure, it's a great register for the bassoon. It's also tender. That would vary the color, but talking about colors and brush strokes and not just doing things to do them, 
well, why didn't I do that? Well, because this is sort of two people kind of having a conversation. So why am I taking this person away and introdu introducing someone else? So that's why we have to really think about everything in the music, the psychology of what the music is saying. So I hope that this is helpful. I'd love to make a series of videos like this that go bar by bar and sort of show some of my thought process and decisions that I make. And um, yeah, so let's end there. Wherever you are, I hope you're having a wonderful morning or afternoon or evening. And don't forget to love yourself and each other. So thank you so much for checking me out and I'll see you on the next one.